Good morning as we go to the Chita. So today we're holding Friday, the sixth reading, the portion of Boy. We're holding the book of Exodus, chapter 20, 12 to 12, verse number 29. was at midnight. Hashem and the Abishta smote every firstborn in the land of Mitzrayim and the from the uh, from the firstborn of the Pharaoh. Yeshua that was standing on the throne. Ad Bakhira Shevi till the third the firstborn of a captive. Asha Besa bird that was in the dungeon. Bakhob Bakhir Behema and every firstborn of every animal. As she says, wherever it says Hashem, Yutke Vafke, the Lord, it means he and his tribunal, tribunal. Bezdinoy. This tribunal, tribunal, um, uh, for the vav, the Hashem, the vav is an expression of an addition. So the vav is so and so. So not only God, so to say, but God and and his tribunal. That means his bezdin, his court, lamaila, above. Hika b'chabacher. Now she says. Even the first bones of other nations who was in Egypt, if they were in Egypt at that time. The Khair Pari, and actually Pari too was the firstborn, but he remained alive. He was the only firstborn of Egypt that survived. Concerning him, God, is, God says, But for this reason, I have allowed you to stand later on. Says before, so this is the reason, the reason that I have allowed you to survive, even though you're firstborn, so you show my strength. So you do, you will ultimately see the crossing of the sea. Ad Why? Why was the uh, the the, the, the who's sitting in a dungeon? Why is he punished? So now because they rejoice. Every see it today till today. Every one of them rejo rejoiced in Jewish people's pain. Furthermore, so they would not say that I would deity brought about this retribution. Firstborn of the slave woman was included, was Tata counts the most esteemed and to the lowest. And the firstborn of the slave woman is more esteemed than the firstborn of a captive. Yakam Pare and Pare got up Laila at night. Of him and all his servants, in the entire Egypt. But to he, the Akka Gedele was a great outcry. In Egypt, because there was not a house that didn't have somebody who was dead. Now she said, from his bread, Laila. Unlike the custom of kings who rise three hours after daybreak, usually kings sleep longer than regular people, but he was up first. For there was a firstborn, he was dead. If there was no firstborn, the oldest of the household member was called the firstborn. And as it says, I too shall make him, David, a firstborn. Even though he was not the firstborn, in that house. Another explanation, some Egyptian women were unfaithful to the husbands and they had children from many other people, not the other guys. Thus, they had many firstborns because they had firstborns from different people. So it was not a firstborn to her, but it was a firstborn to the person that she had a relationship with. So sometimes one woman had five and each of the firstborn to their fathers. He can make a lot and make a lot and Lila and God and 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 he called they called out to make a lot in middle of the night. Amen. They said, Kumutsuumi Techami to get up and leave this nation from our nation. Gamatem Gamade sold everybody go. Well, who you just Hashem could go go to serve God as you said. Now she says, this tells us that the Pharaoh went around from entrance to door house. He went there crying, where is Meshul Abenu? Where is Aaron? Gamatem hagvarim, the men, gamatem yisola, taf, even the children. Everything 
is as you said, not as I said. I said, neither will I let Israel out, is nullified. Who and who are going is nullified. But your flock and your cattle shall not left is nullified. Instead, take all your flock and your cattle. And that's what the meaning I have spoken. You should take, you shall go into the into your hands, your sacrifice and burnt offering. Everything is bottle. I'm the king. I nullify all my decrees. Verse 32, Gantam Gantain Kham Gantam also your flock and your cattle. Who take? I should divide them. And go on. Leave. Please. Please bless me. Now she says, What is it that you have spoken mean? You have to give us sacrifice and free offer. You're going to give to us. I'm giving you more. I'm telling you, take whatever you want. Please pray that I should not die. Because Pharaoh was the firstborn. The Egyptians took hold of the people. The mile is shalchem to send them to hastily send them away. In order from this land, ki amru kolano mesi, because they said we're all going to die. He said this is not according to Moshe's decree. He said that every firstborn land would die, but here the ordinary people are two are dead, five or ten in one house. He saw Ms. Pitaka and the people pick up their dough. Tell him Yachmut is that not yet time to leaven. Sharaisim tell us some lace and shikman the leftovers bound in their garments on their shoulders. Now she says the Egyptians not permit them to tarry long enough to her to leaven. Sharaisam means the remaining matzah and the bitter herbs that they were sitting at the Seder the night before. Al Shikman, although they took many animals with them. They carried the remaining matzahs and the bitter herbs on their shoulders. Why did they carry? Why did they put it on their animals? Because the love of the mitzvah. When the Jewish people did what Mesha asked, they, they borrowed from the Egyptians. They took all the, all the silver and gold out of Egypt. Lost them and all the garments that they can take. According to what Mesha said to them, he told them, each man should ask his friend. Islam and garments is meant more to them than the silver and the gold. Those whatever whatever is mentioned later in the verse is more esteemed. It's interesting. I should tell you why garments, clothes. I realize their servants were taking away their clothes. They're wearing these. You go to your servant. Holocaust, everybody wore the same kind of clothes. So this was an important thing to them that they can put on normal clothes and especially beautiful clothes. So they went down in great glory. And the Lord gave the people favor in the eyes of Mitzrayim and they lent to them and they emptied out Egypt. Now she says, even what they, the Israelites, didn't request, the Egyptians gave them. You said, lend me one. The Egyptians said, take two. In Natsuva, they emptied out the whole land. And the Jewish people journeyed for Ramses. Sukkais to Sukkais. Kesheish mel zagle agvarim, they were 600,000 on foot. Men. Vad mitab beside the children. Nashis menamsis because they went a hundred. They were about a hundred twenty mil. They yet they arrived there instantly, as it, it says, "I carried you on the wings of an eagle." So the with over a hundred, mil is not a mile, but a hundred twenty mil is over a hundred miles. Givarim. Is uh, from twenty years and older. God made of Rav Allah Mohim also the mixed multi great mixed multitude of Egyptians went up with them. So you knew Vakar and they went up with the flock and the cattle. Mikin a covered ma'id was extremely a very big a large amount of cattle. Now she says eight of Rav the mixture of the nations 
Shall gate him. Everybody wanted to become a gate suddenly. They offered a bet second they baked the dough. She had seen it's time, which he took out of its time. August matzes, these were unleavened cakes. He laid chametz, but it did not leaven. He goes to Mitzrayim. This is the, the matzah that they, when the matzah that they had when they left Mitzrayim. So there was matzah before midnight, on the 14th that they made matzah, and this is the matzah of after midnight. The Achlas Mamea. He didn't have, they, they couldn't even tarry. They were chased out. They didn't even have provisions. They were bushed run, run out of Mitzrayim. And as she says, Ugis Matzah's cakes of matzah dough, which not leaven, is called a matzah. The Gantzedel Aslam for the trip, the verse tells us of Jewish praise. Namely, they did not say, how we go out in the desert without provisions? We need to first stock up. Instead, they believed and left. This is what says in the prophets. I remember Zachaiti Lachesed Nurayef. The Abishta says, I remember you, the loving kindness of your youth, the love of you of my the love of uh, the love of Kulasayek. And when you got married, you're following me in the desert, in the land, in a land that's not sown. Now, what does it mean? Israel, what was the Jewish people's world reward? Israel is holy to the Lord. Kedesh Lashem. Abish just saw the unbelievable Mesidas Nefesh and true faith of the Yidin that they traveled into a desert not knowing where they're going and not having any kind of provisions how they would survive. Thousands, millions of people. Verse 40 of Meish B'nai Saul, Shai Yashem Mitzrayim. The time of the, 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 the Jewish people lived in the land of Mitzrayim, Shleishim, Shana, Ubaba Meir Shana, 430 years. Ashi Yashim Mitzrayim, after dwelling in which they dwelled in the Forgian lands, and not of theirs. Shleishim, Ashan. Altogether, we have to count this counting of 430 years. We know that the Yaakov you know, came to Mitzrayim, and there was 210 years. From Yaakov in a continent time. So therefore, altogether from the time of Isaac was born, we're counting for the time when Isaac was born. Until now, we're 400 years. From the time of Abraham had a seed, had a child, Yaakov, Yitzhak, that uh, your seed will be strangers, was fulfilled. And there's another 30 years to the decree from the, between the parts until Isaac was born. So there's there, there is when 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 Abraham had a prophecy that he's going to have a child, and that it's going to go into Gullus, All this prophecy that they're going to be called the Brisbane Absoder when the when the story in Genesis where Abraham's divided the animals after he had this prophecy that he's going to have a child and that uh, that this, and that his offspring seeds his children his grandchildren are going to be in Gullus, and they'll ultimately be redeemed was thirty years before that. So ultimately, 30 years before, and then you have Yitzhak was born, and from Yitzhak you have 400 years until today, till this day. So it was totally 430 years. It is impossible having to say that they spent 400 years in Egypt alone because, because the grandfather of Moshe was the one who came, in, come, who came with Jacob. Go figure out all his years and all the years of, of his son Amram, and figure out Moshe Rabbeinu is 80 years old right now, you'll find them to be that many, uh, uh, you'll not find so many years. Kost lived many years, many of his years before he descended to Egypt, and Amram's years were included the years of Kos, and many of Moses' years included Amram's years. Hence, you did not find 400 years counting from their arrival to Egypt. You were compelled to say that the other dwellings in which the patriarchs settled are also called Ger, a journey. And even when he was in Hebron, it says Abraham and Isaac sojourned in Hebron. The title states the land of the sojourn in which they sojourned. So they see that even though they were in Israel, it was not considered yet. It was still in the, in the, in the mode of Gullus. 
your seed will be your seed will be strange, strange, commencing in Abraham's had an offering. Only when you count 400 years from the time Isaac is born, you'll find a 210 years from the entry to Egypt. You do. So we know the calculation is the time Yaakov Avina came with the 70 souls to Egypt, there was only 210 years left. So that means shard, not the majority of 430 years was started off a long time before. So years of Egypt, this is one of the things that the sages changed. It's one of the stories of Potomia King who made them write the story of the Taylor. They all came with the same conclusion. This number of 430 years, when did it start? Started the British Spain of Sodom when, uh, when uh, Avram Avinu had that Navu, had that prophecy of in the future will have a son and uh, the Jewish people are going to be in exile. Came to the end, 430 years. Came in the middle of the day, 15th of Nisan. All the legions of God went out. This tells us, as soon as the end of the period arrived, the Abishta made exactly, as according to many, Yitzhak was born on Pesach, first day of Pesach. So therefore, it's exactly 15, 400 years later from Yitzhak's birth that the Jewish people went out of Messiah. So as soon as it came to the end of the period of 400 years, 430 years, but 400 years from Yitzhak, the God did not keep them even long as a blink of an eye. On the 15th of Nisan, the angels came to Abraham to bring him his tiding. On the 15th of Nisan, Isaac was born. On the 15th of Nisan, the decree of the, of the, be, be, between the part, the decree of, the, the decree of Ben Absalom, where he had 430 years before, came to an end exactly. So on, on, on the 15th of Nisan, they were found. Leil Shemudim, this is a night of watching, anticipation by God, let's see him at the time to take them out of Egypt. Who are this is the night Shimurimu. This was already protected. So this night was already in, in the in, in the in the card, so to say. It was locked in. That's what we'd say, even Avramavin who kept Pesach, because this night was locked in. The whole B'nai Yisrael will be that will be it'll be a night of watching to all Jewish people lid some for their generations. So the Gemara says, Benissan Nigalu, or Benissan Asidin Ligal. In the Nisan, they were redeemed. In the Midsham and Nisan, they were redeemed again. Leil Shemurim, for which the Holy One, blessed be He, was waiting in anticipation in order to fulfill His promise and take them out of Egypt. Hu Alaylaz El Hashem, this is the night concerning in which He said to Abraham, on this night, I'll redeem your children. Shemurim Levnei Yisrael Adresam, from that time onward, it, 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 the Jewish people guarded it and harmful spirits. The matter stated, he, had, he will not permit the destroyer that this is a night that God watches over the Jewish people. Verse 43, God said to Meshadan, and Pesach. this is the law, this is the statue of the, of the carbon Pesach, called Benecha Leyechobar, no, it's strange, not a, not a, not a, in a strange, a non-Jew is allowed to eat in the carbon Pesach. So on the 14th of Nisan, this section was told to them, Kol ben Necha, so we're going back, we're going a little bit backwards, because we're going to the story, we're going actually before the story, to tell them the law, where this should have been sent before, when the Jewish people made the carbon Pesach. Kol ben Necha, whose deeds have become estranged to his father in heaven, both Gentile and an Israel apostate at Arment. So if you have a Jew, as for Shalom, that's a Meshumit. Meshumit, somebody who gave up his Yiddishkeit, gave up his religion, came an apostate. But I'm on rice later, there's no such people today. Everything is ignorance. There's no concept of a person that's a Meshumit today. Every man a slave who was purchased for his money. Malta, you say, means he's a slave. You bought him as a slave. And you shall circumcise him. Then, even though he's not a Jew, 
but he's your slave, you you can eat, he can eat with you the carbon pest. Now she says it means his master. This tells us that the failure to perform the circumcision on one slave prevents one from taking the carbon pest. These are the words that are sure. That means that not only the, the slave cannot do, eat the carbon pest, the Jew himself cannot eat the carbon pest. But as it says, failure to perform circumcision on one slave does not prevent one from taking the Passover sacrifice. So the argument to other is sure who, if, the, if a person did not circumcise slave, if he's allowed to eat in the carbon pest. If so, what's the meaning? Then he will permit to partake in it. He is a phase referring to the slave, not referring to the master, to the Jew, but just referring to the slave. So a slave, a non-Jewish slave, who he, a Jewish slave is surely allowed to eat in the, in the carbon base if he's a Jew. If he's a non-Jewish slave, he only can eat if he is circumcised. A regular a guy who came to visit you, a non-Jewish person, who's, 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 you hired him as a worker, is not allowed to eat in the carbon Pesach, even though he's your worker. Teisho first again to accept it upon himself to practice it, not to practice idolatry, meaning he lives in the soul, he's going to hate, but he's not, he's not, he's called a ger Teishov. He's called a, a, a person that lives in your community, in the Jewish nation, and he uh, gave up idolatry, but he's not becoming a Jew. He's not allowed to come to Pesach. this is a Gentile, that is not that is a worker for you. You pay him a salary to work for you. Now, why is this verse stated? Aren't they uncircumcised? Why did the title tell us they're uncircumcised? And it's stated, but no one circumcised may not partake in it. So, what does the title tell us that if he's a worker, you might think you have to eat. He's uncircumcised. But this refers to a circumcised Arab or a circumcised Gebana, because they circumcise. The Arabs do circumcise their, ch their children at 13 or whatever. So, there are those who do circumcise their children, even non Jews. So you might think a non-Jew, and especially he works for you, that you are allowed to give him from the carbon pesa. I'm not talking for matzah and mother, you can give them. I'm talking about a carbon pesa. We don't do the carbon pesa today, so we don't have this issue. But in times of Besamikdash, where you did have a carbon pesa, if he was a non-Jew, even if he was circumcised, and even though he works for you, he's not your slave, but he works for you, he's not allowed to eat from the carbon pesa. You have to eat it in one house. They say to me, Abayis, you're not allowed to take the meat out of your house. You're not allowed to break any of its bones. Again, we learned this before. That this carbon Pesach needed to be eaten in Bechabura. It needed to be eaten in a group. But those who can count it upon it may not become two groups and divided. You have to, if you come part of the group, you have to come and sit together. You can't say, you know what? I don't like you anymore, so we'll give me part of the animal and I'll go someplace else. No. Once the animal was shechted and was brought for this group, the group has to sit together. You say it means that one group, or perhaps it means nothing more than one house, as its apparent meaning. And to teach us that it started eating in the yard and it rained, you might enter the house. Therefore, the potato says, no one, uh, one on the houses in which they will eat. From here we deduce that the one who eats Passover Saxon may eat in two places of that house. And for example, they were sitting in the yard, sitting in a beautiful, started off as a beautiful night, and they were sitting outside, and then it started to rain. They can bring it into the house. But you can't bring it from one house to another house. But say to Abayas, again, it means out of the group. If the bone is edible, meaning, if there's an olive-sized amount of meat on it, it, it bears the prohibition of breaking a bone. If there's, no, there's, uh, there's no olive-sized amount of meat on it, nor marrow in it, it does not bear the prohibition against breaking a bone. Kol adas Yisrael, Yasuwe say, the entire Jew, the community of Israel shall make it. What is it stated on, she says? Because it was concerning the Passover sacrifice of Egypt, a lamb for each parental home. We might think that the same applies to the pastor of the later generation. Therefore, Scripture says the entire community shall make it. Let's say I don't have a family. I'm not part of a family. So uh, I'm homeless, God forbid. Therefore, the Torah says the entire Jewish it doesn't make a difference whether you're part of a family, you have no family, you're all alone. 
still after being a carbon paste, you'll have to figure out either to become part of another family or eat if you can handle to eat the whole carbon, the whole sacrifice. If you have a prost, a convert, he makes it as the Passover sacrifice. He morally calls Zacha, but the only thing is, he has to he make he has to make all his males shall be circumcised. Well, as Yaakov says, then he can bring he can bring a carbon. He'll be like any other Jew in the land. Nobody who's uncircumcised can eat from this carbon. You might think that everyone who converts Rashes must make the sacrifice immediately. If right, like, let's say a guy converts, he never made a carbon peso. So you might think the second he converts, he should bring a carbon peso, even though it's not peso. Therefore, the therefore the Torah tells us he shall bring he should be like the native in the land, indicating that just like the native makes a sacrifice on the fourteenth of Nisan, so to a convert makes on the fourteenth of Nisan, even though he became a convert before the fourteenth of Nisan. Why does it tell us again an uncircumcised person is not allowed to eat from this sacrifice? This includes one whose brother died because of circumcision. The one who is not considered an, an apostate in regard to circumcision. And his disqualification is not the right for no stranger shall be taken in. So look, even a, that means even a person, Torah is very strict. Let's say a person, has is a different law. He has a, a situation in this family that they cannot circumcise themselves because they die from circumcision. Nevertheless, Torah says, I know that he cannot circumcise himself. He's putting his life in danger. He can't eat from carbon peso. Torah says, be one law for the native of the land, the stranger that resides in your midst. Ash says this verse comes to liken the, the, the ger, the convert, to the native regarding the commandments of the Torah. It was interesting that, that a ger, convert, is going to come together to do the sacrifice of the, the story of Passover. His family was not in the story of Passover. His family were non-Jews, so they were not part of the story. Nevertheless, they keep once they become a ger, they keep the, the hal de Pesach like anything else. I asked him to come in Israel, Kashan Tiva Hashem as Mesha. And all the children of Israel did, like the Lord commanded Mesha. But I didn't came us, so this is what they did. But he be at the name as I was in the middle of this day. The Lord took out the children of Israel, Mehadi to Mitzrayim, and the land of Mitzrayim, Al Tzavesam, on their legions. That completes the Chumash. We now go to the Tanya today. We are in the middle of the chapter 18th of Tanya, chapter 80 of Tanya. al Rebbe is now telling us, explaining us that we have this inheritance from our, from our parents, from our Avram, Yitzhak, Yankiv. And therefore, we don't have to work very hard. We don't have to really be great intellectual people to, be, uh, to have Avas Hashem because we have like an inheritance. You don't have, that's the difference between inheritance and want something you work for. A guy can wake up one morning and find out he's a millionaire because he inherited something from his, from his grandfather and auntie never knew. He suddenly finds out that his aunt gave him a billion dollars. That's the point of inheritance. Inheritance is not something you get because you deserve. It's you get it because you're in the right family. And uh, that's what happened. Baruch Hashem, we are Am Yisrael, we are a Jewish nation. We are inherited something whether we deserved it, whether we didn't deserve it, whether we have great knowledge, whether we don't have great knowledge. That's the concept of inheritance. And that's why, again, we call ourselves B'nai Avram, B'nai Yitzhak, B'nai Yanke. We call ourselves the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What do you mean? We're the, we're the, children, not, we're, we're the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We all have Baruch Hashem parents. No, but we're, we, we're the children in the concept of this inheritance. So therefore, they inherited to us something that is unbelievable. They inherited us. They inherited us their love that they had, and that love, even though it comes when it comes within me, it might be far from my reality, but it's still within me. It's still there. I got this inheritance. 
So we return to the original point that every Jew has a soul which stands for the loftiest spheres that ultimately each soul is animated by the light of ain't safe by the soul faculty of this wisdom that he has wisdom. Alton Eben now goes on to explain why is it that Chachma, wisdom, that is the original recipient of the light of God. The explanation is based on the discussion of the nature of the soul's faculty of wisdom, which will follow. So ultimately, each and every one of us, Alton Eben explains, has, was inherited to us, was given to us, Oid Einsight, an infinite light, an infinite light, an infinite power. Because we all have within us Chachma. We all have within us the concept of wisdom. What is Chachma? So what does it mean that we have Chachma and therefore we have within it Oid Einsight, infinite light of God? Chachma, which explained in chapter 3, initial flash of intellect. That's what we explained. Pachman, the nebulous, a seminal glimmer of an idea. is the source of intelligence and comprehension, which first begins to emerge in the faculty of Bina, who has explained there in chapter 3 of Tanya, Bina represents the ability to grasp an idea in all its detail and ramification. Hila Maila Mebina, which Chachma is higher than Bina self-understood because Bina comes from it and therefore self-understood, it's a higher concept, a much deeper concept. Because Bina is understanding the idea and grasping it. Chachma is the something that I really can't grasp totally, but it's the beginning of the idea. It's the genius. So in relation to the soul's slower faculty, this single level of Chach comprised of two aspects. On one hand, Chachma is above, is above comprehension in this time. Thus it transcends the lower faculties of the soul and is this aspect of Chachma which enables it to be a recipient of the light of insight. Since Chachma, wisdom, is something that's out there, it's out of the box. Something higher than my understanding, and therefore I always have to, if I want to have a deeper understanding, I always have to dip into my Chachma, go into my wisdom, think out of the box to be able to have some understanding ultimately within the, the, the confines of, the, of, my, of my understanding. Thus it transcends the lower faculty of the soul, and is this aspect of Chachma, which enables to be as serious as light of insight, as will soon be explained, while on the other hand, Chachma is the source of intelligence and comprehension, and thus it's connected to the lower faculty. So Chachma has two concepts. It has with the concept of potential, but it has the concept that through it comes Bina, comes understanding. Emein Chachma in Bina. If there's no understand, no wisdom, there's no understanding. So that it means that Chachma has a dual purpose. It's above my understanding, and it's the source of my understanding. So in this latter aspect of Chachma, which enables it to, suffi- to suffuse the entire soul, because it comes down into Bina, as stated earlier. And in its active state, to affect even one's thought, speech, and action. So therefore, if I always can go a little bit higher than myself, a little bit higher than my understanding, and connect to something that's holier, connect to something that's more deeper, and then it can infuse my soul. And that's why Chachma has the capability if I use all my wisdom, Chachma has the capability to infuse the whole body, to inspire the whole, the whole, my whole entity from head to toe. The, and, and change my thought, speech, and action. I will stay further in chapter 19. And with this we explained before already. This is the meaning of the word Chachma. Chachma contains two words. Which means the 
power of what? Which means the faculty of the unknown. Literally, ma means what? As one would ask something he cannot grant, what is it? Hence, while it's, it is intellectual faculty and thus related to the faculty of Bina, I mean, Chachma and Bina, these are two entities that cannot be separated. That's what the Mishnah says in Pikachu. If there's no wisdom, there's no understanding. If there's no understanding, there's no wisdom. So if I don't understand anything, so I never connect it to wisdom. So these Chachma and Bina, which is Aveim in Kabbalah, they need to be united constantly. So Chachma, as it's above, as it reaches above the concept of Bina, is connected to understand at the same time. Hence, while it's intellectual faculty, it relates to the other lower faculty, it is the faculty which cannot yet be comprehended or grasped by intellect and is therefore also above beyond others. And therefore the Mishnah also says, a person that says, I have wisdom, doesn't know what wisdom is. Because nobody has wisdom in their hand. You're a Talmud Chacham. We are students of wisdom. Meaning that I myself, I'm a student of my wisdom. My wisdom, even if I, even the, the little bit that I can take from my wisdom to give me understanding, I realize my wisdom was like King Solomon says, Achakma, I required wisdom. But I realize how far wisdom is for me. So Shleim HaMelech said, in wisdom, I was, a, I was given wisdom. I was given a gift by God, wisdom. But I realize with wisdom how far wisdom is from me. Say the story of the Alter Rebbe who wanted to give his child the gift of Chachma. The middle Rebbe didn't want to accept it. Later on, when he got older, Alter Rebbe was not there anymore, alive anymore. He said that was a, that was not a smart thing to do. I should have taken the, 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 the gift of wisdom. Because how much the gift would be is always greater. Because Chachma is unlimited. Because that's the beauty of wisdom. That at the time, the same time that we, we have, we all can tap into our wisdom. We all should tap into our wisdom. And we should use our wisdom. At the same time, you're going to realize how deep wisdom is. Because the Chachma is connected to Ain Saif. Because wisdom, the attribute of wisdom, is far beyond the grasp of understanding as it comes down into understanding. And that's why in wisdom, even clothed in wisdom, is is the infinite light of God. The less machshava cloud that ultimately nobody can vest, nobody comprehend any thought of God, which is vested in chachma. And therefore, in the learning of the knowledge of God, it's ain't safe. It's infinite. And then connecting to the wisdom of Hakadosh Baruch Hu, it's infinite. It's never ending. So those faculties, whose functions are into intelligence and comprehension cannot serve as a receptacle for the light of insight, for knowledge cannot grasp the unknown. Only Chachma, only wisdom, not understanding, not knowledge, can acquire, can acquire earn safe. Only Chachma. Only when I tap into my wisdom, which itself is higher than comprehension, can receive this light. And that's why all Jews, every Jew, man, woman, and child, all are believers in God. Because Amuna is above. Faith is beyond understanding. Faith is connected to Chachma, to wisdom. Meaning faith represents the ability to grasp which the intellect cannot. But Adam Yavim, as the Torah says, the fool believes everything 
But the clever man understands. That is a fool lacking understanding, grasp every subject through the medium of faith, while the clever man grasp is based on reasoning. Now this, however, this then is a denigration to the fool for approaching every idea with faith and apply only with a subject in his belief is within the grasp of reason. In this case, the basis of his faith is own lack of understanding, and therefore he's called a fool in this verse. So that's why the point is: if you are, if you have faith because you don't learn, then it's a, you're a fool because there's a you can you can be, you have a lot of faith of God based on knowledge, and therefore you should have an understanding of God. Ladas Hashem. Every one of us needs to use out our understanding. That's why I said before, you can't say, you know what? I'm going to have Chachma and not Bina. No understanding. No, there's a concept that even Chachma Bina does. And if you're just having faith without knowledge of God, then the pastor calls you a fool. But the Abishta gave us enough Bina, enough Das, the pastor should have an understanding of God to the best of our capability. And ultimately, you're going to go even higher. You're going to go even higher to have a higher faith. And that's why faith and understanding continue to grow. That the faith that I have today, and I understand it ultimately, I go to a deeper faith. And then I understand that, and I go to a deeper faith. And so on and so forth. It never ends. Chachma, as I said before, Chachma and Bina continue. It's like an Ur Yashar, Ur Chizer. Constantly, I go come, go forward, come back, go forward, come back, go forward, come back. When dealing with the godliness, however, which is essential beyond comprehension, the truth is we are all fools. That's the truth. That's why even even Chach, even Shleim Amela said, "I have great wisdom, wisdom, but I'm a fool." The chaykimi many. <laughs> I'm not such a great wisdom because God is the ultimate of wisdom. And I am not such a wise individual. All my wisdom is very limited. So that is, that is, so therefore, in relation to the Almighty, which is above intelligence and knowledge, and no one can comprehend him, Hakok psuyim esli is baruch. We're all like fools. Kedoshiv ani ba'ar v'lei eda. As the verse says, I am foolish and ignorant. Beheimay se isi mach. I'm a beast before you. And then he ends off ani tamidi mach. But I'm constantly with you. So the Alter Rebbe explains this verse and says that they're interconnected. They're interconnected. Because ultimately, every person has to realize that even the greatest knowledge and the greatest understanding that he can have and the greatest uh, wisdom that he can have to the Abishta, he's gunched. But that gives him vital. That gives him the concept of his amuna. We should never lose our amuna. Even though we kul on chachamim, we all are great. We have great wisdom. We have great understanding. But we're still nothing. We're still bottled to the Abishta. We're still nothing to God's wisdom. And that gives us humility. That's why, since I realized that with all my wisdom, I'm the greatest knowledgeable guy in the world, I'm the greatest understander, I'm the greatest teacher, but I'm a fool. And a beast, I'm nothing to you, I'm like an animal. And therefore, I still have a muna. Meaning through my irrational power of faith, even though I have the great comprehension, but I still have faith. And that's why, precisely therefore, I'm constantly with you. Because how great my knowledge is in you, I feel like nothing. And that makes us united as one. Because I'm bottled to you. I'm nullified to God. Therefore, 
Therefore, even the most worthless, so to say, of a Jew, and the sinner of a Jew, they're ready to go on self-sacrifice for God, Allah in general. The slavery men knew him and Jews have suffered harsh torture rather than deny God's answer, even though they were not great scholars and they were not great tzaddikim. Majority of Jews that went to Mesidus Nefesh throughout history were not tzaddikim. We're not even religious. But they were Jews. Because when, when it came, pushed to shove, they realized they had to have a Muna. They realized that all their knowledge and all the struggles with God is nothing to their faith. All their intellect, all their comprehension, and all the incomprehensions, all the struggle is nothing to their munas Hashem, to their faith in God. And therefore, they cannot break that faith. Because faith is higher than all the knowledge that they have. And therefore, we're talking about that Alter Rebbe says throughout history, we saw that even empty people, illiterates, Ain't you doing that? They don't know the greatness of God. And even those that have some possession of knowledge is not what motivates them. Klal, that all their knowledge does not really motivate them. They're not ready to give up their life because of the knowledge they might even have. The all's connected to their muna. It was all connected to their faith. Rather, they were prepared to sacrifice their lives without any knowledge. It's just the basic concept of the DNA. It's postured as though they were absolutely impossible. It had nothing to do with knowledge. Simply who they were. Simply who I am. It's not something that I comprehend. It's what I am. And that's what a yid is. A yid is a yid because that's who he is. Not because he knows what Yiddishkeit is, or he thinks he knows what God is, or he comprehends this relationship. Truth is, he doesn't. He doesn't comprehend this relationship. He does it because that's who he is. Elishim tam betaina umayna klal without any reason or rational arguments whatsoever. Were this readiness to face self-sacrifice, intellectual motivated, the benefits and the course of the act would first be carefully weighed. That's how Jews are. When it comes to our understanding, we, have, we are all accountants. And we all become rational, very rational people. And it has to balance. There has to be a balance. In our mind. It has to be weighed out. What's the main gain. Out of A over B. But in fact we see. The decision to sacrifice oneself. Is not based on such rational arguments. Stemming is definitely a non-intellectual resolve. That is simply impossible. To do otherwise. And why did you come to that resolve? By the Mishum Shashem. Echad meyem achayikol, because the, the Abish is in him. Because it's God that illuminates and anim, animates every soul. Because God is in the wisdom of every soul. Which that wisdom is above any understanding and knowledge. It's above and beyond comprehension. So since the light of Ain Saif is vested in every Jewish soul, everyone regardless of this of his level of knowledge, is prepared to sacrifice his life for the faith of God. And that's what we see Allah Dave. Jews have gone on self-sacrifice, gave up Pasha their lives, and went through pain and suffering in life. Of course, they were Jews. Till today, it has not changed. And that's the beauty of Yiddishkeit. That's the beauty of Yidin, I mean. That is the greatness of Yidin. Not their own, not their knowledge, not their understanding, not their great comprehension. The beauty of Yidin is the Mesir is their faith. Maminim, Bene Maminim. We are 
children, the sons of the believers, the sons of believers. And therefore, nothing breaks us. Nothing could break us. Intellectually, we can be broken. As for sure. But our faith is what keeps us going. And our faith enhances our intellect, our chokmah bin and therefore, we're ever, we'll be forever. We'll be forever. Will be an an everlasting nation, because we're connected to in safe to an infinite God, and that beautiful Tanya of today. So, so what a beautiful Tanya! Today is the ninth day of the month, which is chapter forty-nine to chapter fifty-four. If you do those those ten those nine those six chapters, you do the chitas of the day. Mitchem tomorrow is Shabbos. I uh, hope you continue Chitas on Shabbos. Tomorrow is Yud Shvat. It's a very special day. The day of the passing of the of the Fidik Rebbe, the people's Babach Rebbe. The day that the President Babach Rebbe became the Rebbe. I hope like, you all go to Shul and Fabreng a little bit. Don't run away. And sit in Fabreng on this special day of these two great Sadiqim that are connected to tomorrow the 10th day of Shvat. Wish you all a wonderful Shabbos, a beautiful Shabbos, and Mid Shem, we'll see you all on Sunday morning. We'll continue, start again, new, new Pasha, and uh, the Chitas of the day. Shabbat Shalom, a wonderful and beautiful Shabbos.